Oh my god, I hope we have good tires. We have winter tires, remember? I bought winter tires. Yeah, but are they good? No. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah. We can produce every week a high class repair video on a Land Rover. The car just ain't broke every week. <laughs> It's yeah. also fueling the bad reputation if we always fix our Land Rover. Yeah. So we deserve, after 106 videos, to just sit in the car and talk and drive around like everybody else on YouTube. What stuff are Land Rover drivers talking about to make that somewhat interesting in YouTube? Well, obviously about Toyotas. Most suggested topic is on our YouTube channel, why don't you get a Toyota? Now, if somebody says, why don't you get a Toyota? The motivation usually is reliability, which already completely polarizes Land Rover drivers and Toyota drivers. Toyota drivers look at their vehicle with one major focus, and that is reliability. Maybe they absolutely need the reliability because it would be otherwise life-threatening to them, okay? I'm thinking about somebody driving around in Australia, going along, what's that road called? Grumpy old man went on. Ah, uh, canning stuff. I mean, even I have to say, as a Land Rover enthusiast, it's quite challenging to take a Land Rover Discovery 3 or 4 along the canning stuck route. At but least not fast. if you attempt to do this alone, okay? <laughs> you need to be especially brave. So you would be better off taking your Toyota. Even if a Land Rover Discovery 3 or 4 would be more reliable. It would still not be attractive to most Toyota people because it's a high-tech vehicle and it's highly integrated and it's much more difficult to upgrade. Of course, you can upgrade it a little bit here and there, but compared to a Toyota, the game ends pretty quickly. So just take the radio as a sample, okay? Upgrading the stereo or the multimedia system on a Land Rover Discovery 3 or 4 is basically not possible. You can only manipulate it at best, at least the higher end units, because they are fully integrated, which means the steering wheel controls and the display unit and the radio controls share a common bus and a platform. And if you attempt to replace this with a aftermarket stereo unit, you're gonna have to sacrifice certain functions. If you don't wanna sacrifice them, you're gonna have to spend a lot of money. <laughs> you are limited to a very few functions and manufacturers, and you're not getting really a better system. You just get a different system. And you can maybe get one more function, which you didn't have before. So it's bottom line, not really upgradable versus in your Toyota you just go about get yourself the cheapest radio system from Bunnings <laughs> put it in you're done in two hours okay well in my opinion Land Rover drivers are they are driven by passion and Toyota drivers are driven by reason that's all there is to say the big majority of Land Rover drivers sacrifice something in their life to drive a Land Rover versus the Toyota drivers, the big majority doesn't have to sacrifice anything. All they have to do is put fuel in their car and they have a car. That's all there is, which automatically makes it pretty clear that when you sacrifice something, you have to be more passionate. So from that point of view, I think Vera is right. Nobody who is really not into cars would drive a Land Rover. You know, why would they do something like this to themselves? We just got passed by a Fiat 500. <laughs> yeah, and he got run over almost by an Audi A6. For us, one of the biggest reasons why we actually drive a Land Rover instead of a Toyota Land Cruiser is simply because we're able to fix it ourselves, it's way cheaper for us. We never broke down on the road with our discovery. So we feel able that we can do with this car anything we want over here in Germany and in Europe. I'm not going on the canning stock route, okay? Even if I would ship this baby over there, 
I would get myself a convoy with at least 12 vehicles to drive that candy no, stuff. No, then you have to fix 11 of them. Well, they, they would never could do be Toyotas, you know. Oh. Now, there's always somebody now following us with five meters of distance. That's yeah. because we're in France. And in France, they drive small cars. And they always drive like they late to the airport. <laughs> That's what they do. And if you drive your relaxing big SUV in France, you have two or three of those stuck to your back. But if you're driving Miss Daisy in a Land Rover, you determine the speed more yep. than with any other vehicle on the planet. You can pass. Oh, it's yeah. a Mercedes. He's not going to pass. When I just got, you know, a little bit bored with my C-Class, which was just so reliable, there was nothing ever to do with it. I wanted a big SUV and that's when I started yeah. to look at my first discovery, the one Vera drives today. And that car wasn't really cheap. I had to give up a C-Class, double the money, buy a car in the same age with more kilometers on it to get a discovery. It was certainly an expensive car for us to get. And that's when we the first time fell in love with Land Rover. We didn't make YouTube videos right away, but we worked on the car right away like we do now making YouTube videos. Yes. Immediately after I got this car, when I watched YouTube videos about it and researched on the internet, I found out that our Land Rover Discovery 3 has a weak oil pump. And I thought he's nuts. And Vera thought I'm completely we don't need crazy. To change the oil pump. I bought a new oil pump, which was back then coming from a Mercedes like. What the hell is he buying something for 250 euros, which isn't even broken? She yes. thought I'm completely nuts. And then on a cold winter day, I take this car apart, which was heart surgery, if you haven't done that before, alone how high the bonnet was on this yeah. vehicle. She couldn't even look in and it was cold and she had to hold the flashlight and she really didn't enjoy this. No, I got but yelled at so much. when I had this thing out, I could show her, look how weak this one is. It got that weak spot and how reinforced the new one is if I wouldn't have replaced this we could be stranded with this vehicle in the Pyrenees in Spain yes she didn't believe me only years later she realized that I did a really good job <laughs> because I mean there's still people out there today who suffer from the basic oil pump failure in a 2006 2007 discovery yeah I mean to me that is just unbelievable how you can drive this car for so long with this ticking time bomb and not knowing about it. It makes a very specific point about certain Land Rover drivers and I'm gonna get to that point after this break here <laughs> navigating. Yeah. Vera permanently has to type WhatsApp messages with Philip on yeah. her phone non-stop and then she has her map here. She's got Google Maps on her phone and she's got the navigational system over there. And that's the best recipe to get completely lost. <laughs> I got my phone here. Our camera where you see us in is mounted here. Up there is the dash cam, which is B-roll footage, what I use sometimes. <clears throat> oh, there's really a what cruiser behind us. We were talking about that I changed the oil pump on our first Land Rover Discovery 3. They are still oil pump failures today that says to me one thing and that is that not everybody has problems with this vehicle because if they would have problems with this vehicle they would be way deeper into the vehicle and they would realize that it has this ticking time bomb but they don't okay so there must be people out there who drive a discovery just like other people drive a Toyota. They put fuel in their gas tank. Yes. And that's it, that's all they do. Especially the older Discovery 3s, 2005, 2006, they have very reliable engines if you cure that oil pump issue. So there are plenty of those out there with 400, 500,000 kilometers on them. It's not like your Discovery 4, which is in the death zone once you pass 150,000 kilometers. Oh my God. Okay, I got only 110 or 112 now, so I'm not even in the death zone now. That engine just sucks, but it has an extremely good 
driving comfort and it's very powerful and fuel efficient. We're talking about stuff, okay? Another point I want to cut into are the Discovery 3 and 4 drivers who make these Facebook posts showing a picture of their dash with some dash light on and then asking, hey, did anybody have that before? <laughs> but again here, it also says something in particular about these owners, okay? And that is that they have so little knowledge about their car, which they can only have so little knowledge if the car has never really failed them big time, Yeah. which says for them it's a reliable vehicle. And then there is a dash light coming on and they all surprised. And here we are fixing our car so and so often and doing all kinds of maintenance, knowing everything there is to know about it. And there are people driving around who know nothing and have maybe more miles driven on it than we have. So I think it shows that there are reliable vehicles out there. Do you get the point? Yes, I absolutely get the point. I just love those posts, okay? Did anybody have that before? And then the first guy answering, always. Yeah, it's a brake light switch. And then the next guy, nah, but it was the brake light bulbs on mine. <laughs> and then, you know, probably the fourth or fifth comment usually is then, what are the codes? <laughs> and then the other guy asking, oh, I gotta get it red next week. And I go like, how oh can you own this car without having a code reader? According to our videos, that is sin number one. You gotta get a code reader before you even get the car. But like you said, it's the first time apparently <laughs> it's the that first car time. broke down or showed a fault and they have never watched YouTube or Googled anything. Yeah, so for them, the car is actually reliable if they haven't even had the need to buy a code reader, okay? Like I said before, we Land Rover drivers would actually think our vehicles are reliable if there wouldn't be those damn Toyotas. <laughs> and I'm wondering that nobody ever mentions a Mitsubishi or a Nissan. Well, there is well, no Nissan. But a Mitsubishi got... Pachero, it's like non-existent in the online well, SUV world. <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of lets me cut into looks a little bit. If we're talking about the ugliest SUV on the planet, Oh my god, you're gonna get it now. And I feel sorry for my opinion, but that's honestly what it's, I think. It's yeah. the Lexus What Cruiser, okay? I'm just gonna show a picture with the number here. Yeah, Isn't it's it like called? a GX480 or something like something that. Something like that. Some oh XYC 480 Lexus. Yeah. yeah, it is a Lexus What Cruiser. I yeah. think that's what it is. That car is so ugly, especially the grill that it makes a BMW grill look tiny against it. <laughs> and BMW already went completely nuts and stupid with their grills. It is so damn ugly that mothers will take their kids off the road and close the blinds. I think the grill of that car is too big for the Autobahn. I think that's why we don't see it over here. Probably because it doesn't get through customs because it's so ugly. You would put that on the Autobahn other people would see it in their rear mirror and go like, oh, geez, I got to exit right here. <laughs> you know, I can get excited about an old Nissan, 20 years old, oh, some petrol, petrol or something. Good, yeah. But when mm -hmm. I see some newer or even a newer, they just blend in. I couldn't see in my rear mirror what vehicle that is. Versus when you have a Land Rover in the rear mirror, you immediately know what it is, okay? You, well, you will recognize that Lexus. <laughs> I'm sure there are people who like this car and they think a Land Rover is ugly, then I don't want to offend anyone, okay? But I claim that 95% of the population who sees this car thinks, well, so I oh. got that point checked yeah. off my list. Yeah, he wanted to ramble about that Lexus for a long time. <laughs> the reason I know that car is so ugly is because I'm trying to educate myself about Toyotas. I'm trying to be a good Land Rover driver, yeah. knowing something about Toyotas. So I watch the car care nut on YouTube. Yeah. He's got a pretty big channel and the guy is just, to me, amazing. 
He seems to know everything there is about Toyotas and what cruisers oh, and what not. Whatnot. Uh, yeah, he's a okay. great guy. Even he's, I watch him. I gotta put here into the video a short compilation of out of one of his videos on a Toyota. Listen how often he says how easy it is or how great it is to work on a Toyota. <laughs> out of what video? But let me show you what I'm working on. A legend of an engine. This is the 5VZ FE. Best engines ever made. I mean, these things just run and run and run. Timing belt from 1999. It's in great shape. Super, super simple engine to work on. It's very simple. Pretty cool setup. Very simple. I mean, you could have this timing belt all apart in 10 minutes. Probably spend another 15, 20 minutes cleaning, pull the water pump, whatnot, put it all back together. Super simple, super DIY. And it's such a pleasure to work on this. There is hardly any computers in this. This is a very simple OBD2 system. Super, super simple. But what a beautiful car. <laughs> and every single video is like this. Amazing. I like to listen to this guy. He's uh, He's got an amazing channel. And that's why I'm not even exaggerating when I always compare our Land Rovers, which are difficult to work on, with a Toyota, which in my world, they're completely easy to work on. Oh my God, I hope we have good tires. We have winter tires. Remember, I bought winter tires. Yeah, but are they good? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> now, another thing I always wanted to talk about while we're talking about stuff, and I know I'm gonna get excited and I'm gonna start yelling, electric vehicles, electrification. Electrification is not the solution because combustion engines are not the problem. If there are viewers out there who bought an electric vehicle for performance reasons, I think you bought the greatest thing ever. You bought performance. If you think you bought this vehicle to save the planet, I'm sorry, dude, you don't have a smaller footprint than the average combustion engine out there. And the reason is very simple. The electricity you use in your car, in the majority of the countries you drive it in, is not green energy. It's coming to a big, huge percentage out of fossil fuels. The electric engine is not the problem. The problem is the fuel storage. We are going after a system where the resources are held by the Chinese. And it's also very difficult to deal with. Expensive, heavy, slow in refueling. For example, take the new Bully from Volkswagen. It's a nice looking little van and I'm sure it's gonna be really popular. And it's fully electric, and Vera and I saw it the other yeah. day, and it has horsepower, it has a good distance it can reach, it has, you know, it's a well-equipped vehicle. At one point, I learned one thing, and that is, you can stop next to a Watt Cruiser on an intersection, roll down the window, and tell the Watt Cruiser driver, hey, dude, why did you buy such a feather as a vehicle? Get the hell out of my way or I'm gonna run you over with my 2.5 metric ton electric vehicle. And it doesn't stop there. You take an average C-Class from Mercedes in the electric version, whatever that is called, I don't know. They weigh two and a half tons. So vehicles which used to weigh 18 or 1900 a well-equipped c-class weighs today two and a half tons should i go on or was that the word to the sunday that probably was a word to the sunday and remember a two and a half ton electric vehicle is not driving around with kilowatt stunde it's well, also using a lot yeah, that's the other thing you're absolutely right the average driver of an electric vehicle doesn't even know yeah. the consumption, consumption of their vehicle. Of course, they get something displayed in their dash, but they got no feeling. When they have a feeling for it, after a year or so, they realize, oh, geez, this thing ain't so cheap to drive. That's completely different than I thought. 
well, maybe it's because I weigh two and a half metric tons. And then at one point down the road, they're going to realize, hmm, my battery only charges to 80%. I wonder how much a new one is. I'm going to need a new one after like, what, six years? And how much is it? Two thirds of the vehicle price? Oh, I should have kept my Watt Cruiser. <laughs> that was way cheaper to drive. And they are backpacking. Oh wow. my God. They're from the yeah. military. We are car enthusiasts. Our hobby will get cut away from us in the next few years. Maybe the electric vehicles develop so fast that there will be a chance to go over landing in electric vehicles, affordable in the future. In Germany, when you drive a big SUV like we do, especially a black mall crawler like I do here, you gotta make it already a habit to walk around your vehicle when you parked it in the city to make sure that not some climate activist chained himself to your recovery point. You are risking that people throw stuff at you. Cargo e-bikers in the city will park next to you on the traffic light and look at you like you are a terrorist. Definitely. I'm sorry for this little bit out of the ordinary video. That's only we've been driving around today and the Land Rover wasn't broken and it was raining and we're on a road trip like every other Toyota driver. The next video will be the regular content again, more technical. And um, okay. yeah, I think that completes it then. Yeah. And we want to thank our Patreons a lot for their support. And we'll see you next Sunday. Very well. It's slippery here. Yes, I'm kind of stressed. We're done talking now and we can focus <laughs> on the road. No, oh, please don't.